Hi, I'm Eric from Park Tool, and this is Truman. And we are here in the plush Park Tool studios to bring you the New and Blue show, episode five. So today we're going to talk about some new product. We're going to talk about some behind the scenes things, video, our community grant program. And uh, let's start out with new product. So uh, starting in the front, We've got what look like bottom bracket tools, and we make a lot of different bottom bracket tools, but these are lock ring tools, some of them e-bike specific. These are the LRT series. So Truman, take it from the top and tell us what those do. All right, so we've got the LRT1. The LRT1 is for Bosch Generation 2 motor drive units. Uh, so these, it works great, fits uh, any Generation 2 Bosch drive unit. The LRT2 is for Shimano Steps drive units, specifically the ones with the Holotech 2 spindles. Uh, the other ones that Shimano makes are square spindle, and this does not apply to those. This applies to the ones with the Holotech 2 spindle. Then we have the LRT3. The LRT3 is used primarily on uh, chain ring lock rings for Cannondale Specialized FSA. Uh, so for their direct mount chain rings found on some of their hologram cranks from, uh, from Cannondale and then some of the S-Works cranks from Specialized and some of the FSA cranks as well. Uh, and then this fourth one would be for direct mount chain rings on the new Shimano standard direct mount cranks. So on the new XTR, XT, SLX and some of the new Dior cranks they have a direct mount chain ring. This will help with those lock rings. And then to drive those with a torque wrench, because some of these have a pass-through spindle, you can't have a socket that goes over it, so you need a crow foot. So you can use this crow foot on most of these, of these right, lock rings. 36 tools. millimeter. That's correct. The only one that you don't need it on is the LRT1, and that is because we know exactly how long the spindle is coming out of that one. Right, so that's a lot of numbers, a lot of letters. You can find all the information on all these new things, including all those details, what it fits on our website. So let's move to this, which looks like one of our three ways, but it's a composite material, and it's got a very specific function. Yeah, it has some pretty cool functions. So this tool is uh, made for kind of electronic things on bikes. EWS1. Two large functions of this would be for the Shimano DI2 drivetrains or any kind of Shimano product using E-tube wiring. So we have a tip here for installing E-tube wiring and clipping into shifters, clipping into rear derailleurs or front derailleurs, clipping into junction boxes. Then we also have this removal side. You can use it for mostly for removal. You also can use it for installation in some cases. Uh, but this, these are at an angle to get into tighter spaces. Uh, the third side, that is for coin cell um, battery covers on commonly found on the back of e-bike computers or standard bicycle computers or the bottom of e-tap levers. Um, so that, and it fits in there nicely, kind of uh, based off of uh, the profile of a coin. Just for taking the, just unthreading the, the, the cap on the back. So yeah. these, the other two functions can be very frustrating if mm -hmm. you you're trying to get that in and you're trying to get it out and that really solves a problem. Yeah, and a lot of times people lose the small, tiny tool that, uh, that Shimano offers. Right. Um, this is a double-ended spoke wrench, uh, SW9. And the reason we have this is because a lot of times um, you need to get in a tight space. This is basically our black and our red spoke wrench, so the SW0, SW2. Sometimes you need to use a spoke holder to grab uh, a bladed spoke or even a round spoke, and you have to get underneath that. So it's not as fast as our regular loop style spoke wrenches, but it's, it's got a specific function so you can get into a tight space. This is the latest in the dummy series. Yeah. Right? We have dump. a dummy pedal. Yep. We have a dummy hub. This is a dummy fork. Yeah. So why would you use this? So the dummy fork is primarily for shops that are doing suspension service. This takes the place of where you took your fork out of. So it keeps all of your headset bearings, headset spacers, your stem, 
all of your brake, uh, brake hoses or brake lines uh, and shifting cables all intact and in the exact place where they came from. And it also gives you a place to mount your brake and then a pad spacer for disc brakes. Common scenario at a bike shop would be they're gonna take the fork out and either service it or send it in somewhere. And you wanna keep everything together instead of dangling here and there, you run the risk of damaging parts and so on. So this would mostly be for a professional a repair shop that's doing multiple forks and they, they just don't wanna take that risk. We have the overhaul mat, which is underneath. Yeah. So this is the OM2. We make an OM1, which is a little bit smaller. But this one rolls up real nice. It, it's a semi-sticky material. But just put it out on your bench and lay your parts on it. And you can actually hook multiple uh, mats together. Yeah. It's got a little channel under the, uh, the left and right edge here. So just a handy way to keep parts safe on your bench. Yeah, I've been really happy with these. They're great. So these are bleed kits. And we have not made bleed kits up until now. Uh, most of the bleed kits on the market are brand specific. These are much more universal. So we're trying to cover pretty much all the popular brands and some not so popular. But one is uh, a dot and the other one is mineral. And we don't have all the bits and pieces out here because there's a lot of them. But as you'll see in the video, you get a lot of fittings with this. Um, there's a, a few unique features. So why don't you just talk in general about how our bleed kits work? Yeah, so our bleed kits work. They, have a, they come with a very high quality syringe, uh, high quality hose, a locking clip to keep fluid from coming out of the hose. Another cool feature is the bleed blocks. They have a 12 millimeter side for uh, brakes with a 12 millimeter slot. There's also a 10 millimeter side. That's most brakes out there. And you'll see all these holes. That's for fitting uh, multiple different kinds of brakes, depending on how the clip retaining works. There's also these slots, which are needed for certain brakes as well. So these are very universal, very handy. A really fun part about this kit is the syringe holder. So when you're bleeding a brake, often it takes, it's a two syringe process and sometimes, you know, and then you, all of a sudden you get to the point where you need to remove one of the syringes and the other syringe is left dangling. So say you're taking the rear syringe off and you're gonna finish bleeding on the top syringe. So you'll clip this onto the, the top one and onto the handlebars, clip the syringe on, and then you can remove your lower syringe, finish up your, uh, your caliber bleed, and then move up to your lever. We spent a lot of time on these and there's a lot of detail in here. And uh, they are out, they're out, out for sale now. Just in general, why do you bleed brakes? So in general, why you bleed brakes is a couple reasons. Uh, air has been introduced into the system, or you know, say maybe your pads wore down and then the air that was coming into the reservoir is then pushed into the system. And then you have air in the system and you can compress that air because it's a gas, it's compressible. Uh, you want it to be all fluid. So to get rid of that air, we do what is called bleeding, and that's why these are required. Another reason would be for specifically more towards the dot uh, brakes would be, so dot fluid is very caustic and it takes on uh, kind of atmosphere. So it'll take on moisture out of the air and it'll actually build volume and get you know, kind of big, bigger. So your system will be too full and you cannot put new pads in. So in that case, you'll want to get rid of that old fluid that is a lower boiling point than it started at, and you'll want to go to this new fluid, and you'll also want to reduce the volume size. So a couple reasons you'll want to bleed. They work on so many different brakes. Right. It's very versatile. So we do have videos for all of these, um, and they're brand-specific videos. Mm -hmm. So you can find those on our YouTube channel, which we um, highly recommend that, that you uh, follow us uh, on YouTube. And they are very specific to your break. So look, you find the video for your break, and it'll use one of these kits or the other. Uh, speaking of video, the next thing we're working on is? Working on wheel truing. Uh, wheel truing, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So we're gonna go into truing of wheels, both radial truing, lateral truing, dishing, right. uh, and So look for those in, in the next month or two, I guess. Yeah. And speaking of wheel truing, we at Park Tool have been in business since the early 60s. 
And almost right out of the chute, we made a truing stand. And it was, the original stand was made under the Schwinn brand name. And then we started making them under the Park Tool brand name and Schwinn. But Calvin and I are going to go downstairs and we're gonna talk about the history of Park Tool truing stands. So let's go downstairs to the, to the workshop and um, see what we got. Hi, I'm Eric Hawkins, President and Chief Mechanic here at Park Tool. And I'm here with Calvin Jones, our uh, Director of Education. And you know him from a lot of our YouTube videos. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit more about Park Tool history. And we have now 57 years of history. Started in 1963 in the back of a bike shop. A lot of the tools in the beginning were made for Howard and Art, the founders of Park Tool, to use in their bike shop. One of those tools was a wheel truing stand. And we're gonna kind of walk you through the evolution of the Park Tool wheel truing stand. Uh, we didn't invent the wheel truing stand from the beginning. They were made back in the 20s, I think, or the 30s, uh, one version or another. And Calvin, tell us the purpose, first of all, of a wheel truing stand. Any tool should make your job easier, and that's what these things do. You take the wheel out of the bike, we drop it into here, and it really helps you isolate the wobbles, the lateral run out in the deviations. Right. So it, it, you know where to fix things quickly. You can do it other, other ways, but this speeds the work. And when you're working in a shop, you wanna work fast, and that's what it's about. Right. We're doing our best to be six feet apart, but sometimes I can't see Calvin, so there he is, right there. All right, so we're gonna start with the very first wheel truing stand we made. This is a TS-1. And this was made originally for Schwinn Bicycle Company. Um, we found some literature from a Schwinn sales catalog from 1969. I believe that's about when it happened, 68 or 69. And this was, uh, this still used the concept of both uprights moving in simultaneously to always have the wheel in the center of the stand. So this one we made for about four years only, and then we moved to the TS2. And Calvin's got his hand on the TS2. Tell us how that is different mechanically and structurally than the TS1. Well, the TS2 has got some more adjustments than the, the TS1. This is the model that I would have cut my teeth on as a young mechanic truing wheel after wheel after wheel on all those Schwinn assemblies. So this one, the, the, uh, the main uh, caliper arm here right came here. down and was welded to the center bracket. Here we have a bracket that's in front. On that one, the bracket goes straight into the middle. So because of this system here, we can shove this left to right and adjust it nicely. We also have collars here that let the two arms move independent the two upright arms independent of the center caliper arm. So a lot so more the adjustability. the TS2 was made from 1973 uh, up till about 2010, I mm -hmm. think. A long run. Right, and it was basically the same stand. We made some um, improvements as far as manufacturability and accuracy, et cetera, but there are literally, literally hundreds of thousands of TS2s out in the world. Mm -hmm. And notice also here the tire size. So our little, right here. little fingers here, we're getting a little, little bigger. A little bigger, and yep. that trend will continue. Well, from the two, yep. we added the mighty TS3. Yep. So this is a, a different paradigm. It's, it's a really fun stand. Uh, this one moves on 12 bearings, much like a, a suspension fork, stanchions and, and uprights. So the bearings in there let this move smoothly, centered to the middle. So both arms move parallel. That's a unique feature. They don't come in on an angle. Uh, but what this relies on is a quick-release skewer. And of course, everyone has a quick-release skewer, except now when it's all through axle. Except when they don't. This is not going to work so good on, on the through axles anymore. Uh, in addition, we can see the size that we're having now 
The right. huge ones would not fit here. So it was good in his day. It was a lot of fun. It was expensive. Yep, it was when very you... accurate, but very expensive. And people say, why don't you make the TS-3 anymore? Bring back the TS-3. Well, we can't bring back that stand because it really won't work on the majority of wheels for now. And to start over, that's an idea, except near the end of the reign of the TS3, which was probably four or five years, we weren't selling very many. Mm -hmm. So everybody wants the old stuff that they didn't spend money on years ago. Right. But it was a very expensive stand and it was worthwhile. That's the first stand that we put dial indicators on as well. That's right. So from the TS3, really from the TS2, we went to now the TS 2.2, and this one has been out for about 10 years, I wanna say. So what we did is we made these uprights longer, and we made everything a little bit wider. Here you, uh, you have the calipers, again, got a little bit bigger because tires got mm -hmm. a little bit fatter, and um, again, for the way we manufacture it and the accuracy, we made several improvements along the way. So TS2 is what we make now. We also make a powder-coated version of this, which is blue. Mm -hmm. yeah, imagine how about that. that, imagine that. Well, do we have any, anything for the, uh, the home mechanic here? Yes, we do. So, um, this is our first consumer truing stand. This is a TS6. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that this worked was basically there are little gradients on here. You set that in and you set your own center by moving these. And then you bring the caliper arm up similar to a TS1 two, uh, or 2.2. Um, not really made for heavy duty use, but it worked well for a home mechanic. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we did have a TS-7 in between, but this is the TS-8, and this is what we manufacture now. And the premise of this one is to true from one side, Calvin, so tell us how that works. Right, so we have an indicator coming along the side there, so the rim wobble wobbles, you make a corrections, uh, this side looks good, you can uh, undo the quick release skewer, or axle nut, flip the wheel and see how your centering is and then do the other side. Right, which is actually a very accurate way yep. to center works. a wheel, it to dish well. a wheel and it by flipping the wheel. For different hubs, slide us back and forth. Right, there, so. so different hub widths. You now, bet. if you want to use this one with through axles, it does take another tool, which is a through axle adapter that sits right in here. Uh, but this works great for quick release type wheels. Right. So. All of these stands, um, even though the TS 2.2 and the TS 8 we still make, they kind of lead us to this because this is our biggest stand now that we've ever made and really the, the, the one with the, the most function, so to speak. Um, this is a TS 4.2. We made a TS 4 for a couple of years and we had a few changes we wanted to make, so now this is a TS 4.2. So tell us about this one, Cal. Well, big. We kept thinking, we've got, these are big enough. Boy, these calipers are plenty of big enough. Now we right. hope they're big enough. They're giant. So, but also the skinny tires are also important. So right. it does come all the way down to 100, and it goes all the way up to, well, over 200. A nice speed knob. Why don't you grab the tire there, and on top, I'm gonna open this up. And, okay, up, so like a little fire drill. Oh, okay, here comes our 100. No, it goes up. So these nubbins in here are nice for the through axle. All right, 12, 15, 20, no problem, we've got you centered. So there you have it. Those are wheel truing stands that we have made over the years, over 50 some years. Mm -hmm. And it, the, truing a wheel is, is a special kind of satisfaction, mm -hmm. but the machine that holds the wheel, gauges the wheel, gives you, basically it magnifies what the problem is, like, like Calvin was saying. In the end, they're just a lot of fun because these are, are great machines. And um, these are used pretty much in every bike shop 
all over the world. And uh, along with a lot of the other tools in our history, we're pretty proud of all the steps we made over the years to make these better. So there you have it. That's a little bit more Park Tool tool history. And now we're going to send it back upstairs. Keep truing. Keep truing? Keep truing. <laughs> And we're back. Uh, a couple other uh, housekeeping items on our website. Uh, we now have replacement parts available. Sorry, US customers only. Um, but we've been making hundreds of products with thousands of parts. And there's thousands of parts now listed on our website. So you can go right on there, find your clamp, your repair stand, your truing stand, whatever you need, and buy parts right off of our website. Again, sorry, US customers only. The other thing I wanna mention is every year, right around the first of the year, we award community grants to nonprofits and people just doing great work in their community with the bicycle. And from our perspective, it's always people fixing bikes. A lot of times it's fixing bikes for kids or with kids. Some of it's uh, to get people on bikes that uh, normally wouldn't either be able to afford them or just a, a way to integrate the bike into their community. So you can find a list of our 10 community grant winners on our website under the news section. And if you are a nonprofit and uh, are interested in something like this to outfit your workshop so that you can expand the kind of work you do uh, on bikes, the next um, application period, it'll be in, in November of 2020. So the uh, last thing I wanna talk about is our Instagram, which is at Park Tool Blue. And we wanna see how you're doing. We're, we, are, we are filming this in the middle of June. So we're still somewhat under isolation and people are working from home and getting the old bikes down and fixing those up, bringing them into the shops. Uh, but we want to see how you're working at home. Um, and you can do that with hashtag... Wrench from home. Wrench from home. That's yep. really catchy. Hashtag wrench from home, at Park Tool Blue. Show us what you're doing at home, and we'll uh, repost and kind of collect some of those, uh, some of the best ones to show as well. So that's it for episode five of the New and Blue show. Uh, we've got a lot of new products in the hopper and we will be introducing those in the next few months. And until then, keep wrenching and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>